Welcome to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church on the third Sunday of Easter. Next week, we will begin our newcomer sessions. Looks like we have another 20 or 30 people looking to join in this round, which we're so grateful for. Um, for those who are watching online, don't hesitate to share with others, invite others. Even if you can't be here, you might invite someone who can be. Information about those sessions is on the website. Now, let us join in worship.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. When was the last time you were scandalized? I saw the Book of Mormon yesterday. We went to celebrate my 40th birthday, which was a couple weeks ago something scandalous about turning 40. I had been warned about this musical, that it was very vulgar, but still it had won a Grammy, it had won a Tony, it had won Best Musical all those years ago, so I was interested in it. But nothing could prepare me for just how scandalous it was. It felt like being Queen Elizabeth in the red light district, just something not right about this. Yet it was so hilarious that we were captivated the whole time, even as troubling as it was. 
I tell you about it, not because I necessarily recommend you go see it, but because it illustrates one thing the Mormon church does very well. It equips and sends people to do it exactly what Jesus told us to do in Luke today, to be witnesses, to witness to the truth about who Jesus is. It's easier said than done, especially for a tradition with a lot of Northern Europeans back in the days. The Mormons go through extensive training before they go on a mission, lest they be put on the spot and not know what to say. Maybe you've been there. I think of grandparents put on the spot by a grandchild. Grandma, what happens when we die? Grandma breaks into a cold sweat. Well, we go to heaven. Does everyone go to heaven? Grandma changes the subject. The same goes for questions about Jesus. Grandpa, did Jesus have a mommy and daddy? Yes, Mary and, and Joseph. Then why does he call God Father? Well, I guess he did say that a few times, didn't he? It's no easy task to be witnesses about who Jesus is, who he was. The disciples struggled with this as well. That was the whole story today. They couldn't make sense of their experience of Jesus. The risen Christ appeared in their midst just days after he was crucified and risen. And they see him and they're terrified, doubting, and disbelieving. So Jesus does everything he can to clarify for them who he is. He says, I'm not a ghost. Look at my hands and feet. Scholars point out it's not necessarily because the wounds in his hands and his feet, but making the point that if he had bones, which you can see in your hands and in your feet, that he wasn't a ghost. I thought that was interesting. He says, I'm alive. Bring me something to eat. Then he opened their minds to the scriptures. He was doing everything he could to help them be witnesses because Jesus needed them to understand and have language for their experience lest his movement die out. He needed them to witness to what they believed. That was the name of my favorite song in the Book of Mormon, I Believe. One of the main characters is this young, earnest missionary, Elder Price. He sings it. I'm inspired from the musical a little bit, so I'll, I'll sing a little bit about it. It's a song about having absolute belief, no room for doubt. A Mormon just believes. Elder Price struggled on his assignment. He went to Africa for his mission. He was dismayed because there were no baptisms happening. And so to pep himself up, he sings, you cannot believe just part way. You have to believe in it all. My problem was doubting the Lord's will instead of standing tall. I can't allow myself to have any doubt. It's time to set my worries free. Time to show the world what Elder Price is about and share the power inside of me. I believe. And the refrain goes on. A Mormon just believes. No room for any doubt. What a witness. What a bold witness. It made me wonder, what would the St. Paul's version of that song be? I believe my worth is a gift, not an achievement. I believe that God loves us all unconditionally. I think that'd be our version. Now, I know not everyone is into musicals as much as I, so I'll be done singing now. But let me offer a couple other things that might help you as you piece together your witness of the risen Christ. 
First, a framework to understand what kind of witness you might share. I think there are three types of witnesses. Absolute, dissolute, and resolute. An absolute witness is one with no room for doubt. These people can be hard to be around sometimes with their absolute witness. Elder Price in the musical was an absolute witness. No room for doubt. You cannot believe just part way. You have to believe in it all. If you ever have a feeling of doubt or uncertainty, just turn it off, as another one of the musical numbers puts it. The second type of witness that I think is most tempting for us to fall into is dissolute. When a person isn't quite sure what they believe or a little confused about it, they just give up. Give up seeking, give up learning, and they settle for a lukewarm faith. They become lax about prayer, lax about worship, lax about any daily spiritual practice. This is the reason churches are dying all around us. Dissolute witness. People are uncertain what they believe, so their passion fizzles out. What is the alternative? If not absolute nor dissolute, I think the most promising kind of witness is resolute. Not absolutely sure, but I take all of these things into consideration and I resolve to continue to follow, to continue to learn, to have a witness. I read such a witness in the Wall Street Journal this morning. I don't know how many of you read the journal. I check it every morning along with the New York Times. We say we're a church guided by intellect, so we work hard to consider more than one point of view on any given matter. Well, in this morning's journal, there was an article witnessing to the mental health benefits linked to going to church. And wouldn't you know, halfway into the article, they quoted a certain Abigail Visco Russert, my wife. She works at Princeton Theological Seminary, this fancy job. She's actually teaching adult ed later this morning, so you can go over to the multi-purpose room and, and join the fun. But in the article, she offered a resolute witness to the difference her tiny church, Forest Grove Presbyterian, you've probably driven by it, the resolute witness to the difference that little church made in her life. Because as a young person, people in that church knew her by name. I think of that priority we're trying to work on, culture of welcome and invitation. It starts by knowing some people by name. It's especially harder for a bigger church with three services, but something we have to keep working at. It was a part of what inspired Abigail to go into ministry, that experience of her church where she was known by name, a resolute witness of her experience. Not an absolute witness rammed down people's throats, not a dissolute witness, witness careless and thrown to the wind, but a resolute witness of a real life experience. Which brings me to the last part of my message. Jesus said we are witnesses to who he was. I suggest we be resolute witnesses, but what would the content of our witness be? What would we talk about? If you ever explain something to your kids or to a friend or to a neighbor, why you are Christian or why you go to church, where would you start? Again, I suggest three possible things to share about. A favorite story about Jesus, a meaningful promise 
from Jesus or a meaningful experience of Jesus. A gospel story, a gospel promise, or a personal experience. If you do one thing in response to this sermon, answer those questions for yourself. What is a favorite story about Jesus, the promise of faith most meaningful to me, and what experience have I had recently where I think God was involved? First, favorite story from the gospel. In the passage from Luke, it said Jesus opened their minds to the scriptures. He knew these were going to be formational to their witness. Always have a story ready to share about. What is your favorite? For me, there's nothing better than the prodigal son. Not so much because I relate to either of the sons, but because I'm so grateful for the father in that story who tells us something about what God is like. Not condemning the wayward son with eternal punishment, but throwing a party for him when he finally came home. I love the story because it illustrates that second thing, a promise from Jesus. The promise of God's unconditional love that our worth is a divine gift, not a human achievement. That's the story that represents that best, I think. That what transforms us, that really changes a person's heart in the end, is not punishment, merited love and grace. It's the only thing that changes a person's heart for good. So there you go. My witness to the gospel would be that story of the prodigal son, the promise of unconditional love. How about an experience recently that you could witness to? Jesus showed up in my life just like he did for the disciples showing up in that room. He showed up in my life these last weeks through this book. We've been talking about this one a lot, Life Worth Living. Some of you guys have read it. Jesus showed up again for me at the end of the book in the chapter, Making It Stick. You know, you've thought about all of these changes in life. They had a chapter called Making It Stick. And in it, it talks about a daily spiritual practice called the examine. E-X-A-M-E-N. You can... If you have the book, it's on page 266, or you can look it up, the examine, and read about these five steps, these five reflections you can go through at the end of every day. St. Ignatius developed the practice in the 1500s, and it's a tool for identifying where God showed up for you throughout your day. There are five parts to it. You start with gratitude. What am I grateful for today? And then review, you go through your entire day, hour by hour. Sorrow, where did I maybe kind of mess up or fall short? Forgiveness, where do I need to ask for forgiveness? And then grace, looking ahead for tomorrow, where do I need to ask for God's grace and direction? Gratitude, review, sorrow, forgiveness, and grace. Again, you can look it up later, the examine. It says, each moment offers a window into where God has been in your day. And so I've been doing the practice for the last two weeks. At the end of my day, I'll sit in my chair in my room, just like those disciples huddled in that room. And I'll sit and I'll go through the practice for 15 minutes. And as I do it, these little blessings from the day or these interactions that were forgotten, they spark back to life for me. And they offer a little window into where God might have shown up in my day. And so I reviewed yesterday. And it was amazing how much I could remember as I went through my day hour by hour. And I remembered something sweet one of the kids did in the morning. I remembered the guy at the pizza shop in Manhattan who smiled at me. I remember the usher at the show. He complimented my hat that I was wearing. I remember I had dropped a $20 bill under my seat at dinner and the waiter went down and picked it up and handed it back to me. Oh yeah, I forgot about all these things. Thank you, God, for all those blessings through my day and I felt connected to God's presence as I reviewed my day. Sometimes there'd be those sorrows, those needs for forgiveness 
I talked to God about those too. But the bottom line is it's an experience of God's presence that I've had recently, and it's brought me a tremendous amount of peace. I talked about turning 40. One of the scandals that I'm discovering is as we grow older, it gets harder to sleep. Just, just when you need more sleep for your old bones, it gets harder to sleep. It's a scandal. But I found doing this practice at night, putting away screens and just for 15 minutes doing this examine leads me into this deep, peaceful sleep. I think of Jesus coming into that room. The first thing he said was, peace be with you. Jesus keeps showing up, trying to offer, to that, offer that to us. And so I share a resolute witness where Jesus is doing that in my life. Jesus said, you are my witnesses. What gospel story, what promise from God, what experience that you've had of the risen Christ are you ready to share about? You don't have to sing about it like Elder Price, but I think it would be a scandal to keep our resolute and life-giving witness to ourselves. Let us pray. Living God, we rejoice in Jesus Christ this Easter season. Enable us to step aside from our busy lives and take thought about life's meaning and its end. 
May your son be the companion of our thoughts, the one who said, love your enemies, who said, fear not, only believe, who said, do not store treasures on earth, but store them up in heaven. Incline our hearts to follow in this way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, your eternal presence is hid behind the veil of nature. Help us behold the lilies and daffodils as we drive past, to commune with the soil we dig up, to be amused and grateful for the animals that flit and scurry about. Renew our commitment to care for this planet you have entrusted us with, so that all may find it habitable for generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear a prayer. O God, may your kingdom come and your will be done in places suffering death, longing for justice, and sorting out where to find your peace. Turn your gaze to Israel and Gaza, Australia, Ukraine, Sudan, and all places hurt by violence or war. Grant your daily mercies. Comfort those who grieve. Console those who suffer. Have compassion and give health to those who are sick. And be with all in need, especially those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O author of life, those who have died in you now see you fully. We thank you for those we have loved and lost and name them before you now, especially Don Alderfer, the father of Abby Philetic, and all those we name before you now. Assure us of the peace that you have promised, that we may join the saints in everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.